I would say when discussing the state, there are two main arguments that Marxists run into and that you will probably run into. And those are, first of all, the ideas or the arguments of the anarchists um, who say that we should abolish the state in one go, completely get rid of it overnight almost. And the other side to the argument that you'll probably come up against is that of the reformists who say we should reform the state, uh, essentially, that we should capture positions within it and try and mould it to our own interests. And we say that neither of those arguments are correct, neither of those are right. And in fact, Marx answered both of those arguments um, over 150 years ago. He argued with the anarchists in the first international and debated with them. And the reformists, he argued against the reformists in the trade unions um, in England for a lot of his writings as well. So our understanding of the state, the Marxist understanding of the state, was perfected through these polemics. A lot of the writings that we have were polemics against these other arguments, against these other um, ideas that were in the labor movement, in the socialist movement. And that's how we have come to our understanding, our scientific understanding of the state today. I mean, during the course of the Russian Revolution is when Lenin wrote his excellent pamphlet, The State and Revolution, which I'm sure many of you will have read. And it was based on the events that he was going through. You'll see that at the end of it, you know, he writes something like, it's better to experience and be a part of this revolution than just to write about it. He's like, I've got to go get back to work. So everything we know is based on that concrete experience. Marx based his understanding and changed his understanding and improved his understanding of the state, obviously, after the events of the Paris Commune. So, Marxists have throughout history scientifically studied the origins of the state and through the experience of the class struggle and then the culmination of the class struggle, so through revolutions, come to conclusions on what we say must take its place instead and what we should do with it. And I would say that this is very different to how anarchists conceive of things and how they conceive of the state. First of all, we have to say you cannot simply reject the state you cannot just say, no, I'm not going to be a part of this or I'm going to ignore it. Anarchists talk about abolishing the state all in one go, and we say that this is utopian. We know that you have to understand the world if you want to change it. And so we have to understand the state first and foremost. We have to understand where it came from. And I say that there are serious consequences that can develop from not understanding the state correctly and not studying its origins. In 1936, the anarchist workers, the most courageous and revolutionary section of the Spanish working class at that time, rose up in an insurrection in Barcelona and they smashed the fascists that were trying to join Franco's rebellion. And in a really short space of time, the workers were in control. Factories were occupied under workers' control. The only power in Barcelona at that time uh, were, was the power of the armed militias of the CNT, which was an anarchist group, um, and the left-wing organization, the PUM. And as a result of the heroic actions of the anarchist workers in Bas Barcelona at that time, the fascists were smashed. They, they weren't able to, 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 to make ground. So you had this situation where you've got workers' control, factories under workers' control, armed militias that were looked towards by the rest of the masses as, as their kind of key leaders. And the old bourgeois state was there, but it was just kind of hanging in the air with no support. So in reality, power was in the hands of the working class, the armed working class, because they were armed at that time <coughs> to defeat the fascists and so on. All that was required was for the CNT effectively to arrest the bourgeois government and declare that power was in the hands of the working class to take it and say, this is ours now, we are going to run society. And that fact was even recognized by those who were in power. The president of the Generalitat, the, the bourgeois nationalist government that existed um, in Catalonia, the president invited the anarchist leaders into his, into his office and he addressed them in the following terms. He said, well, gentlemen, it seems you have the power. You ought to form a government. But the anarchists rejected this because they said well, they're opposed to governments and they're, 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 they're opposed to that form of, form of power. So there's a lot more that can and should be said about the course of the Spanish Revolution. And there was a lot that went on. That was a very short kind of excerpt. But what I'm trying to show is that without a scientific 
uh, materialist understanding of the state and without the study of revolutions and past periods, which is obviously what we strive to do as Marxists. If you don't have that, and if you believe that the state is essentially just this, this bad thing, because we agree with the anarchists that the state, the bourgeois state, is, is an oppressive force um, and is a barrier and doesn't act in the interests of the working class. But if you kind of leave it that, um, and just think it needs to be rejected, then in revolutionary situations, serious mistakes can happen, and did happen, and have happened throughout history with anarchists. So it's very important for us to understand where we differ from them on these sorts of things. But I would encourage all the comrades to read more and study that period of the Spanish Revolution, because there's a lot that can be said about the anarchists, um, and about the Stalinists, and various other forces at that, at that time. So, we explain that the state is a product of historical development that emerged through a process of class differentiation. This isn't a lead off on the origins of the state in its entirety, that deserves a whole other discussion. Um, but for the context and for some background, I do think we need to go into it just very briefly. So in brief, you know, where did the state come from? So as the forces of production developed um, to produce surplus goods, classes of people started to develop. Classes of people became to be recognized on the basis of their relationship to the means of production. And this changed everything. We can't underestimate how much of a transformation this was in, in the way society looked, organized, and humans related to each other. All of this was completely different. Because before that, there wasn't a state. There wasn't this class differentiation. We haven't always had a state. I'm sure you've heard that said many times. And under primitive communism, essentially, um, there was no basis for different classes. There was no basis for a material basis for an idle class, a group of people who didn't have to work. Um, there was no point in enslaving somebody else because everyone could only provide for their own needs anyway. They could only live off literally what was in front of them. Um, there was no basis for anything else. But at a certain point in the development of the productive forces, in the development of society, at a certain point in this process, it did become possible to live off a harvest, to live off a surplus of goods um, and produce a surplus. This was a marked difference with the existence of the primitive communists and, and the way that they had lived and, and, and organized. And it was the first time that the question also arose, who gets this surplus after I die? Who's going to get it? Are we just going to leave it out there? Um, just, you know, kind of in the, you know, out there. Um, and so this is the first time we see the possibility arise for, for idleness for some people, essentially. Um, and on this basis, class societies began to, to arise. So this is societies that were divided between laboring, the laboring classes, and those who, who didn't need to labor, those who lived off the labor of others, the possessing classes who managed to keep this surplus for themselves. And this separating of society into different groups also meant people had to play different roles. This is when we see the division of labor begin to take place. Basically, the birth of class struggle is what emerges. And this obviously takes on different forms in different locations. It's not going to look identical in every single, in every single point of history that we, that we look at. Um, but based on this contradiction of this new emergence of different classes, of hostile classes, because they're hostile to each other, uh, based on that contradiction, that is how society develops, like an engine room, all of these forces suddenly coming together. And it's on that, that contradiction, the basis of that contradiction, that we see the emergence of the state. But Engels said that the state, in its essence, is armed bodies of men. And how is that linked? How is that linked to what I've just described, this process of early transition from primitive communism into class society? Well, I'd say that this is because as the state arose, and a surplus arose, and new classes were being formed, the minority needed to protect their surplus, right? And they already, this was the minority class that was, that was you know, harvesting it and keeping it. So how could they protect it? Well, they did it with armed force, with organized violence. That is why we say the state in its essence is, is armed bodies of men. Now, clearly the state today is not the same as it has been in the past. It doesn't look like what it did when it, when it first arose in, in these first states. And it has gone through many different changes. We've had ancient slave states to feudal states to the modern capitalist state that we live under today.
but we would say that the role of the state as a weapon for the ruling class to defend its interests has not changed. Its essence has not changed once. But throughout history, it has been polished and refined. And we would even say it's become a more effective weapon for each new ruling class that wields it. They have learned over time what is the best form of state, what is the best way to govern. Um, the ruling class also pays attention to history and pays attention to class struggle. The serious wing, anyway, that wants to stave off class struggle and knows how they should use the state. And so we have to do the same thing. Often when we talk about the state as Marxists, we point to the police, the army, the courts, and all of these are important pillars of the state, um, the most oppressive pillars of the state in, in many ways in terms of um, you know, the most obvious violence that can be inflicted amongst, amongst people, amongst the working class. But we would say that it's also much more than that. Your average person, when they think of the, the state or the government, they don't just think of the police um, or the army or something like this. Everyone interacts with the state in some kind of capacity, right? As a child in, in school, if you're in school, you're under the influence of the state, state kind of mandated. As a worker, of course, you have to interact with the state if you're unemployed, if you're an immigrant, if you're a refugee. Essentially, unless you live in a far off remote location um, where you can kind of grow your own food and, and live off the land, you will be interacting with the state. And even if you do, as some indigenous groups still do in society, you still can be confronted with the state, which is constantly trying to expand. You know, there's different examples in, in, of indigenous groups in the Amazon rainforest, for example, constantly in battle with the Brazilian state over them trying to thank you, encroach on, um, on their land and, and take more away from them. There's plenty of things we can point to. Um, so we can't really escape it. But I think that the way that most people probably think about their interactions with the state and do interact with the state is through things like the NHS and through the benefit system and the Department for Work and Pensions. It's these sorts of things. This is all a part of the state as well. And that's why Engels and Lenin were very careful when they, when they talk about the armed bodies of men, they say, yeah, that's its essence. That doesn't mean that it's all that it is. You know, as, as Marxists, we don't have a fixed answer for what everything is. We take a, we take a dialectical approach and we have to look at things and in, in, their, in, in the way that they're related and also in the way that they contradict each other. Um, when we say that the, that the state in its essence is armed bodies of men, what we're saying is that people wouldn't listen to the state if the threat of organized violence wasn't behind it. That's what it comes down to at the end of the day, because if you don't do what the state says, and if you go against it, then you will be thrown in jail, and you can be arrested, and that's where the organized violence comes from. So as I say, that there is the NHS and the benefit system and all these things that supposedly do benefit our lives and school and all this kind of thing. And the reason why that's relevant, and the reason why I'm putting so much emphasis on it, is because this is part of what gives rise to the reformist approach to the state and reformist arguments um, on, on how we should understand the state and interact with it. Social Democrats who, who see the state as a good thing, they say, yeah, no, the state is good, we need it more in our lives, we need it to, to help us, we need it to oversee things, we need to just make it better, let's capture more positions. If we ran the state, we would do it in a better way. We need to capture positions and wield it for our own purposes. But that doesn't work. And the reason that that doesn't work is because the state is a tool for the bourgeois class and it is tied by a thousand threads to the ruling class. That's what we have to remember. It's not a separate part of society because that is exactly what the ruling class wants us to think, that it's somehow separate and somehow different to the rest of the, the ruling class. But that's not true. When Jeremy Corbyn became the leader of the Labour Party, for example, it was a political earthquake. It really shook things, and it terrified the ruling class, actually. They were, they were horrified by, by what they saw. And he had a left-wing program. He was, it wasn't a Marxist revolutionary program, but he had a left-wing program with, with good demands and, and so on. And he had plans to make a few changes, uh, you could say, if he, if he came into government. And immediately, as early as 2015, generals in the army came out against him. Right? And they said that this is completely unacceptable. So a senior serving general warned that a Jeremy Corbyn government could face a mutiny from the army if it tried to downgrade them. This unnamed general, who's obviously been, been protected, 
also said that members of the armed forces would begin directly and publicly challenging the Labour leader if he tried to scrap Trident, if he tried to pull out of NATO, or announce, and this is a direct quote, any plans to emasculate and shrink the size of the armed forces. <laughs> now, this is, this is the attitude that different elements, this, this is proof that you can't, you can't just reform that. What was, if, if the army had come out, and we've seen this in history, by the way, other, there's other things you can look at, um, other examples of, um, of Labour governments being attacked, or not much, not even on, on as much of a radical programme that, that Corbyn was trying to implement. Um, so the ruling class isn't just going to sit by when they feel threatened by a figure like Jeremy Corbyn, or even just a, a kind of a, a left reformist, an honest left reformist, which is what he was. The ruling class won't just sit by and say, okay, well, I suppose they elected him. You know, there was a, there was a democratic election, so we've just got to let him implement his program. No, they did everything they could to stop him winning a, a general election, um, and they succeeded, right? There's a lot that we can go into and discuss about the, the successes and failures of the Corbyn movement and the ultimate failure of the Corbyn movement, which is, which is why they lost, um, which can be the topic for a different time. But... It's, a, it's an important way for us to understand, uh, sorry, it's, I thought it's an important example as to, as to where the reformists get it wrong. That's not something that can be reformed because the state is completely tied up with the bourgeois class by a thousand threads. There's a constant revolving door between the state um, and, and the rest of, 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 and capitalism, basically, and the capitalist class. Um, so I've given the example of the army, but also, as I said earlier, it's more than this. The state has more kind of elements to it, in particular the civil servants, right? Um, if anyone, has anyone seen the show The Thick of It? Right, in The Thick of It, who makes the decisions and gets things done? It's not the MPs, it is the civil servants, right? It's the people working in the offices that are having to direct things and sort things out and all this kind of... The civil servants play a massive role in upholding the state. And of course, they are born into society and generally taken from a section of society that is... Um, uh, just bombarded with propaganda and they are completely absorbed in the ideology of the state, which is something I'm going to come on to a bit later, um, which is how the idea of the state manifests itself. There's another show that's a bit older called Yes Minister, um, which is also a brilliant example of, of, of the role that the civil um, servants uh, play in, in, in government and, and that, how even though they're not elected officials in any capacity, but they have massive power and control over, over what happens in, in the state. And so I would also say that the reformists end up playing an important role for the ruling class. They're actually quite helpful because they justify the existence of the state with their attitude. They constantly justify it and, and take part in, in mystifying it in many ways. The reformists say to the working class, yes, things should be better for you, but don't attack the state. We've got to use the state to get there, right? So they kind of stave off the class struggle by using that process. And that's incredibly dangerous because in doing so, they justify. In doing so, they buy into the myth that the state is a neutral or impartial arbiter in the class struggle that could then be directed in one way or the other. But as we see from the history of the origins of the state, this is not true. Um, but this myth is important for the ruling class because it, it, that is the, the, the myth is the basis for how a tiny minority can justify its rule over the majority of people. Not solely through naked violence, right? We don't, in Britain anyway, live under a, a military dictatorship in which everything that we do is under the, the immediate threat of, of, of violence, right? That, that's not what we live under. But because the bourgeois state and the ruling class have learned over time that it's much easier for them to rule effectively because an oppressive military dictatorship can and will force a reaction at some point, right? Because it's so blatant, it's so naked, the oppression that's taken place. What's much more useful for the ruling class is to mystify it, is to mask it, is to say, yeah, no, you can have an election every five years and vote for one or two capitalist parties um, and seem like you're, you're having a choice. That is a much more effective way for them to rule. And that's what they want. And that's why they spend a lot of time um, promoting these ideas, promoting, um, you know, uh, they dress the state up in Latin and women wigs and gowns and constitutions, which I'm also going to come on to talk about, because it's more useful for them. And every time a reformist bows to that pressure, they're doing the job of the ruling class for them. And they're lying to the working class. They're lying to the masses by suggesting that the state can somehow be on their side when it's not true. So I would say that to fight reformism, we must be able to dispel this myth of the neutral state. 
Um, there are other forms of state power. The media plays a massive role. Um, clearly, you know, with the media coverage of the RMT strikes recently, it's obvious to see what, what side the, the state is on. Also, the education system plays a massive role in continuing to justify the state in, in, in many different ways. That's why we ran this campaign, the Tell the Truth um, campaign in the MSF uh, last year or the year before, uh, which was to kind of counteract the lies that we are told in the education system as well. Wasn't the British Empire a good thing and you know we should be proud of, of this or that thing. Um, so there are other forms of state power but I would say the main myths surrounding the modern day state arose with the bourgeois revolutions. Oh gosh my laptop's gonna die. Okay um, so in the enlightenment period um, and the 19th century the young and increasingly strong bourgeoisie, the middle class producers, they're on the rise, they became more and more critical of the old feudal relations which had kind of kept them bound, had stopped them from living the way they wanted to. So ideas of liberty, of free commerce, of free ownership of the land, the abolition of feudal privilege, natural law, the rights of man, all of these things grew out of the changing social landscape at that time. They were born through the bourgeois revolutions. And I think we are all generally familiar with a lot of these ideas, not because they are innate to the human character and it's a great British love of freedom or anything like this, which is how Boris Johnson and these types present it, but these ideas are the ideological foundation of the society in which we live that was born through the bourgeois revolutions. So the bourgeois revolutions which smashed the feudal system then ushered into society these ideas that we now currently base ourselves on. But how is it different? You know, we talk about the bourgeois revolutions, which were revolutionary, you know, and progressive in terms of smashing the feudal state, but obviously they didn't smash class society as a whole. So the essence of the state actually remained the same. In The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State, which is a, an excellent book by Engels, Engels writes about the rise of the Athenian state. And he says that, as, you know, in terms of the origins of it, as long as Athenian production was on a low level, um, you had this Gentile constitution, which was based on family ties and, and tribal administration, and that was sufficient for a period of time. But again, as I said earlier, as the forces of production developed, there was a surplus of goods, classes of people that suddenly became recognized on the basis of their relationship to the means of production, not on the basis of their tribe. We see this transformation take place. Those who are part of the ruling property-owning class um, concentrated wealth and power in their hands. They used their wealth to inflict debt, bankruptcy, and slavery onto the lower classes. And then they used this new weapon in their hands, the state, to sanction all of this through law, you know, through, through, through legal systems, effectively. And so the initial rise of state power in Athens was never anything other than the consolidation of the rule of the rich over the poor. Right, and then this state structure with, with in different forms, and sorry, so like you had these legal institutions, kind of legal systems that are developed, and then the question of how to protect those legal systems comes into place, right? The same thing is true when the state structure was formalized after the invasion of William the Conqueror in 1066, for example, um, which was a system where you know the monarch basically owned all of the land, some of which was granted to its nobles, um, who in turn would allow serfs to work on patches of land in return for life of servitude, all of this kind of... In all of these systems, the point that I'm trying to get at is that this setup was transparently preserved by the armed bodies of men, right, that were available to the feudal lords or, or whichever system it was to maintain them. So like in Athens, the state and its armed bodies of men were uh, openly a weapon of the possessing classes against the non-possessing classes. And, and the, re the reason I'm, I'm bringing that up is although, you know, the bourgeois revolutions were obviously revolutionary and progressive in terms of smashing the feudal system, the essence of the state has stayed the same from the rise of the Athenian state to feudalism to William the Conqueror to the modern capitalist state today and that hasn't changed. But they try and dress it up, as I said earlier, they've tried to mystify it and make it seem better in different ways because this naked oppressive rule isn't useful for them. So we have things like constitutions and the constitution, if you think about it, particularly in America, there was, oh this is against the constitution. In England it's less uh, kind of prevalent, I would say, the way they talk about the Constitution, but we have things like the Magna Carta, all of these things that were uh, quite significant, I would say, in the bourgeois revolutions. They were a major conquest of the revolutions. And they also were the product of the class struggle itself, right? Which was to force concessions from the old established order to guarantee certain things. 
But all of it plays a role in continuing to, to justify the state. If you think about bourgeois legal theory regards the state, as I said earlier, as this impartial arbiter um, that exists uh, above, above society. Um, and that is what we constantly have to dis dispel. Um, as I said, the view is shared by the reformists of, of many different varieties, but it ignores the fundamental fact of the way in which it, it manifests and, and what its essence is, which is the, the police, it's the courts, and it's this threat of organized violence that stays behind everything that we, that we do. It serves the interests of one class in society, and that is, um, in the case of capitalism, the capitalist class. But I would say with historical materialism, with the Marxist method, we can put the state in its place and say this is what it fundamentally is and this is why we need to overthrow it. So Marxists are not in favour of abolishing the state in the way that anarchists suggest, nor of reforming it. So what are we in favour of? Well, the worker state, um, essentially. So we say that the working class needs its own state, but it will be a state that's completely unlike any other state that has ever been seen in history. Marx's theory of the state is inseparably, inseparably bound up with the revolutionary role of the proletariat in history. The culmination of this role is the proletarian dictatorship, right? The political rule of the proletariat. That is first and foremost, that's kind of the essence of the worker's state, um, if, you, if you want. And the worker's state obviously has to come about through a uh, socialist revolution. And in that process, the raising of consciousness, which will be necessary in the development of, of the class struggle, that process will have thrown up different forms of workers' democracy, right? And that workers' democracy is what is essential to the worker state as well. Um, I think Trotsky said that the, the worker state needs democracy like the, the human body needs oxygen to breathe or, or something like this, or maybe he meant you know, socialism in, in general. And it's through the process of, of a revolutionary situation that forms of workers' control, the kind of embryonic forms of, uh, of, of the worker state will be thrown up. I mean, even today, if you read the book In the Cause of Labour, uh, which is a brilliant history of the class struggle, of the trade union movement um, in the UK, uh, it makes the point that trade unions are kind of the embryo. They're the most basic form that the working class have. And it's an embryo of, of what the new society, of what a socialist society should have, because it's the basic way for workers to come together and organize and make decisions and elect people on, in, in the way that we should. So we already have the kind of small embryonic forms of, of what a workers' state can and should look like. And the best example of this forms of workers' control, of course, are, are Soviets. Now, the Soviets, um, and there have been Soviets in different, in different times, in different periods in history, obviously in the Russian Revolution, but also what I was describing earlier in terms of the Spanish Revolution, you know, effectively Soviets, these bodies of, of, of workers that were elected in factories in different places. So the Soviets are elected workers' councils, effectively, and they've taken, taken place, as I said, in different times, um, in which workers participated, are elected to run their workplaces, localities, and regions. And we would say that that democratic method is much closer to the working class and the interests of the working class than bourgeois democracy. It's completely, completely different because it gives people immediate control over their lives in a way that parliamentary bourgeois democracy doesn't and never can do. So if we have a revolutionary situation develop and you see Soviets forming, and they might not literally be called Soviets, the name isn't important, it's the form, it's what is happening. If we have uh, bodies of workers, of people coming together to implement control over their workplace, their regions, under those conditions, our slogan is all power to the Soviets, right? Which is what um, Lenin and the Bolsheviks put forward. We don't say that right now because Soviets don't exist, right? So it would be a bit silly for us to run out onto the hill shouting all power to the Soviets because there are no Soviets. It wouldn't connect with anyone. It would be, it would be ultra left. We can't declare into existence the Soviets and, and expect them to appear. That's not how it will work. And that's not what happened in the Russian Revolution. The Bolsheviks didn't announce we need Soviets and that's what, and that's what took place. No, the revolutionary situation developed consciousness, developed the struggle, so Soviets were born and the Bolsheviks had to win over a majority on the Soviets and they didn't have a majority at the start. Actually, the Mensheviks did, and it was through time, through the political program that the Bolsheviks put forward, that they did then win the confidence of the Soviets um, and therefore you know, have that democratic mandate to, to, to rule. Um, 
So under capitalism, as we say, the state is a weapon which uses the police and army to maintain its rule. But a proletarian state would be different, but it would need um, organisations, defensive organisations. A workers' army would be necessary, especially in a revolutionary situation when we know counter-revolution um, is, is guaranteed to take place. As we say, the ruling class isn't just going to sit back and say, OK, well, they really want this, um, so we're not going to do anything about it. The whole might of the capitalist state all over the world will come on our shoulders. And so we need a workers' army and we need these defensive organisations, which will have elements elements of the embryonic elements of a worker state, democratically elected officers, the right of recall, all of these things subjected to the discipline of the organised working class. That will be necessary in the worker state. But the worker state will not be necessary forever. It won't always exist. And we say that eventually it will wither away. Now, what do we mean by that? We say that withering away is only possible once the working class is, is the ruling class, effectively, once they have all political rule. Because, as we say, the state is the product of the irreconcilable class antagonism that exists in society. So if you remove that antagonism by making the working class the ruling class, then you're removing the material basis for the state. And over time, it will wither away. So we say that a genuine proletarian state will, by its first act, essentially begin the process of its own destruction because it won't be necessary um, to, to exist over time as you know, socialism develops and the productive forces develop to a stage where there's no kind of remnants of, the, of, the old, um, of old classes or, or anything like this in society. So just to end then, and, and this was quoted yesterday and it's probably quoted a lot, but it, it's worth um, remembering. The philosopher Hegel said that real freedom does not come from attempting to transcend the laws that govern the world, but from understanding them. And once they are understood, these laws can be harnessed for our own benefit. And I would say that Marxism provides us with an understanding of the state, its role in society, and how we can smash it. Thank you.